All right, let's say we had, now we're looking for specific problems here. Let's say we had a problem like this. There was water going through here. This happens to be one foot, say the diameter here, one diameter here, point one. And so we want to know, given that this is one foot apart, What's the flow rate? Q, which is AV, which is in, say, cubic feet per second. So it's a volumetric flow rate. And to start with, let's just write Bernoulli's equation. Let's list it like that. We don't know, um, or we, I'm sorry, we do know one thing. These elevations are the same, so they will cancel. Um, I can slip uh, the pressures together, but there's no particular reason to. Now, since the streamlines basically go parallel underneath or around this interface, and then they start bending to go in here, The crucial point is right here, from here up, the streamlines are straight. If they're straight, everything is okay. If, in fact, say, say this, uh, if we zoomed in on, on, say, this area right here, and we looked at it, say the tube came up like this, and say someone left part of the tube right there. So when the particles come by, they have to turn to go around this. Of course, what makes them turn is the fact that there's a higher pressure here that forces them to turn. In other words, a particle moves. If it's changing directions, there has to be something forcing it to change during that portion. If not, it will keep going straight. That means that there's a high pressure on one side and a low pressure on the other. This means that this would give a false reading or this height up here would be too high. But since they are straight, we can write Bernoulli's or we can write the manometer equation straight through them. Meaning that the pressure at one, given the fact that we're going to identify that as one, is equal to nothing more than this height between there and there we'll just call this say K K gamma plus one foot times gamma now we can likewise say pressure 2 is nothing more than K gamma now, we don't know what K is, and we really don't care, but what we do is we put this in, K gamma plus gamma, we could put the 1 in there, but we'll leave it out, rho V1 squared over 2 is equal to K gamma plus rho V2 squared over 2, and of course what we get is this term cancels that term, and we get... Uh, moving them all together, rho over 2, V, say, 2 squared minus V1 squared is equal to gamma. Only reason that's gamma is because this is 1 foot. If it was, say, 2 or 3 feet, it would be a 2 or 3 here. But it's only 1, so um, we're going to keep it that way since I started that way. Now we've got to figure out the relationship between these two. 
Okay, here we use the manometer equation. Here we're going to use continuity. So we're going to say A1V1 is equal to A2V2 is equal to Q. If that's the case, then we can say nothing more than this. Q squared over now. If we want to look at this real close to find V2, V1 is equal to Q over A1. squared minus Q squared over A1 squared is equal to gamma. Now if you go a little further down, you'll realize that Q can be represented as the square root. I'm going to take this and I'm going to call it rho times G. Then I'm going to slip under it rho, so I'm going to have G 2G over this mass, which is going to be 1 over A2 squared minus 1 over A1 squared. Maybe I made it a little too far there. So, take a look at this and you realize, hey, A1 is equal to pi d1 squared over 4 and a2 is equal to pi d2 squared over 4. I'm going to just keep writing them in until I exhaust everything. 2g over now. This is squared already. pi squared d2 to the 4th over, you square a 4 and you get a 16, okay, now you can start putting things in here. Um, now we may want to take a quick stop here and look at our units. Okay, we got feet per second squared over, and we're just hanging around with this underneath here. And each one of these is 1 over feet squared and then squared again. So flips this uh, flip this thing up. And at first glance it looks like things were messed up. However, we have to remember that there was an H here. Even though that H was equal to one, there was an H so there was an H here, there was an H here, and that made that a square, um, and there was an H here. Now, the reason I got away with that is because I went ahead and put it in as a 1, but if I'm considering units here, I have to be particularly careful here. Now, that these all together gives me feet sixth over second squared, but it's the square root of there, and it becomes feet to the third per second, or cubic feet per second, so I'm okay with this. I should have done this a little bit differently and carried this as an H, since I was carrying all the other variables, that would have reduced the confusion here. So at this particular point, I can go back to where I was, put 1 in there, 16 pi squared, what is d2? d2 is 
to the fourth minus 16 pi, what was d1? d1 was 1 squared, and square root this. So if I go in there at this point, I'll find, and I get about 0 0.00397 cubic feet per second, which I may be off. But the key is, and if I am, you can correct me or comment on this. I'm not going to run back and look at it that much. But the key is, is what I came in first is wrote Bernoulli's equation. The second thing is, I used the manometer equation. And then since I had a change in area, I used the continuity equation. I combined them all up somewhere around in here and completed this solution out. So you need to be able to work these type problems. Now another type problem is this. Let's say you had a flow that came into a pipe and did something like this. Now, sorry for the bad drawing, but let's say the liquid came up to about right here. And it came up to about right here, down in there. So what we're seeing is, say, this time I'm just going to carry it in as H. But I have to identify some new points here, okay? And let's identify some logic. This purple fluid here, I mean, this actual purple fluid exists all in here. This is, let's just call this, you know, water. If I had a particle back here, and it flowed downstream, I could find the particle that basically would sit there and hit the inlet of this tube. Now, if you zoom in on the tube, you may find a large inlet, and then it gets bigger as you zoom in. There are particles that go in here, and they don't continue to go down this tube. If they continue to go down this tube, what that would imply is that the water would come out here, out in the atmosphere. That's not necessarily what happens if this tube is tall enough. So this tube becomes as if it's solid. The flow moves up to a certain level that offsets the pressure down at that point, and then there's no more flow in here. So essentially, particles come in here, come up to this thing, and then go around it. However, there is one particle that basically what is called stagnates on there. Okay, stagnation implies something that's not moving. Uh, velocity equaling the zero. So we can label a point right there at 2, and we could state V2 is equal to 0. It actually stagnates on there. When it stagnates, remember, P plus gamma Z plus rho V squared over 2. If we just so happen to be talking about location 2, this means kinetic energy is gone. It basically removes the kinetic energy. Well, what happens to it? it goes to one of the potential energy terms. Depends on the way you look at this, but it sends the water higher up the tube. You're stagnating, you're taking the kinetic energy out at that point and turning it into potential, moving this water up the tube higher. So, let's work this problem. We're going to give it numbers, but for right now, I'm going to call it just say D1, call it D2, I'll call this height, 
uh, my standard K unknown and let's take off and do this here's location one there's location two so P1 plus gamma Z1 plus rho V1 squared over 2 is equal to P2 plus gamma Z2 plus rho V2 squared over 2. Now, the old standards. The datum was drawn from there. These two are at the same elevation. They cancel. So what is P1? Okay, well, here we go to the manometer equation. If you go to the manometer equation, I would say P1 is equal to K times gamma plus H times gamma. Sorry, I have to retract that. It's just K times gamma. I move to the top of this fluid. I basically start off here, and I go up to that point, that column is K. The gamma I moved through is just that of water. Now, now I have to fix the one. P2, however, is equal to K times gamma plus H times gamma. So I have to apologize for that. The other thing, since this is stagnation, this term is zero. What I end up with is K times gamma from here plus rho V1 squared over 2 is equal to K times gamma plus H times gamma. Meaning that the kinetic energy that was here got transferred in on these two terms. Well, that term can drop that term out and then I get V1 is equal to and I can move the 2 over 2H gamma over rho so I move the rho underneath take the square root say 2H gamma rho underneath or 2G and since gamma is equal to rho G I can basically put in a rho G here and cancel out the rho and I get that out of it. Interesting. V is V1 is equal to 2GH. I took all the potential energy, removed it, I mean all the kinetic energy here, removed it, and I get this value here. This is the same thing that you get from dropping a ball from a certain height. So you should be able to be given H, G, and 2 and figure that out. Now, let's swap these two. What do I mean by swapping those two? Well, let me see if I can spend a few more minutes and make a better drawing. Okay, here's what I'm looking at. Oh, I should make one mention here. Notice something. Didn't matter what necessarily D1 and D2 was. Never in the solution is there a D1 and D2. Think about that as we go. All right, of course I'll call this D2, I'll call this D1, I'll make my fluid purple again. And it's purple throughout. I'll of course be interested in that point because it's the stagnation point. I could be interested in a point back here, zero, that's not a stagnation point. 
and then I'll be interested in this point. Now, oh, and I need to be come up with this height difference, and I'll come up with my my k as well. Here's my datum. There's my k up to that point. Now, I have to be very clear on this. So if I wrote uh, Bernoulli's equation between two points, it implies that the particle, if it started at zero or O back here, it would end up at location one. However, one could argue if I zoomed in on this area and looked at say here's O or the zero and then I have my tube sitting here my particle ends up stagnating there by definition my point stopped and it moved no further however I can move off a small delta below it or above it and follow the particle there now even if it's just a few particles over it'll turn and go up and around this and on downstream now you can call this particle O primed if you want to but if you look at it the energy difference between those two only deals with the Z elevation between them and if Z is small enough then essentially these two particles sitting on top of each other you know a micron or so apart have essentially the same energy so although technically I can't write between 0 and 1 and 2 I can move up a micron right between 0 prime and 2 and I can write between 0 and 1 it just so happens that 0 and 0 prime have essentially the same energy so I can do this but legally if you're gonna split hairs you cannot write this equation this way so the logical argument is that we can do that and we can do that based upon the fact that these two particles essentially O prime plus gamma so let me write what I'm saying I can write between O prime and 2 and I can write between so technically I can write between O prime and 2 and I can write between O and 1 again what I'm saying is here's here's particle O and here's O prime O stagnates the other one goes up and around ends up back here at 2 but it just so happens that these two are essentially equal because their energy levels are there only a micron apart so therefore I can connect two to one through these terms so technically now P1 plus gamma Z1 plus rho V1 squared over 2 is equal to P2 plus gamma Z2 plus rho V2 squared over 2. Now I can start executing some of these things. My datum sits right here. It doesn't matter where I put it anyway. These two are at the same elevations. They disappear. Now I can start using manometer equation to look at the fact that P1 is equal to K plus H times gamma and P2 is equal to just K times gamma so I can insert these in here K gamma plus H gamma plus uh oh there is no velocity there because it's stagnant 
So this means there's nothing more on this side. This term is this. This term is 0. Now I'm looking at P2, which is K gamma, plus rho V2 squared over 2. Now I can take out this as a result of that. And I can have H gamma is equal to rho V2 squared over 2. Go down a couple more, move my 2 over to H gamma over rho is equal to V2 squared. One more set would tell you that V2 is equal to square root of 2GH. All right. Now, another observation, the one we made before, D1, D2 didn't matter. Now, if D1 and D2 don't matter, then it, none of this matters. What I mean by that is this. Let's just assume you have a straight pipe up here. You have a tube sitting here. Down here, you have a stagnation tube, or whatever you want to call it, sitting down here. They're the same diameters. And as a result, you'll have your liquid in here and your liquid in here. Okay, you can start labeling them. I'll take that as 2, stagnation. Take this as 1. So we'll list this as our K. And we'll, whoop, sorry. And we'll list this as our H difference. P1 plus gamma Z1 plus rho V1 squared over 2 is equal to P2 plus gamma Z2 plus rho V2 squared over 2. Same argument applies. These two are at the same elevation. The datum was there, but it doesn't matter where I put the datum because they're still at the same elevation. They cancel. I go to the manometer equation. And I find that P1 is equal to gamma times K. I find that P2 is equal to gamma times K plus gamma times H. And I insert those two. I notice that the velocity 2 is stagnant. So what I get is gamma times K plus nothing. Well, no, sorry plus rho v1 squared over 2 is equal to gamma times k plus gamma times h. These two cancel, and so I get the standard v1 is equal to 2 g h and the square root. Again, there's no mention of the diameter. So let's go one step further. Anyone that has any association with a aircraft of any sort would recognize something called a pitot tube, or a pitot tube, depending on the way you pronounce it. The tube itself is a tube within a tube. So let's say it had a tube like this that essentially went up or I think I'm going to make it go down. And then around it, it's very thin tube that encases it that has holes all around it. So even though you see two holes here, what you would see in fact is a circular section with holes all the way around this thing. There's holes drilled all the way through this tube. So you see two here, but there are holes all around it. And it comes down as well. But it comes off the side. These two chambers don't mix. In other words, you have this chamber right here. 
does not mix with, say, this chamber. These chambers don't mix at all. Now what happens is, is they come down and they're connected together like this. Now, but in a process, there's a heavier fluid down in here. So there's a heavier fluid down here. and there is a height difference here so here's the flow it comes basically here now let's say we take two particles our O and again our O prime here they go racing towards this tube one comes up and hits right there stagnates we'll call that location one this one goes up a little bit off goes around the side and goes on past this tube goes on now we'll call this one location 2 now we're going to consider this air right out here so and we're going to consider this say water so we're just going to say gamma w now the density of air is very small compared to the density of water. Likewise, the, the gamma of air is very, very small compared to the gamma of water. <coughs> but if it was not, you'd have to consider this elevation here as well. And through the manometer tubes, you realize they cancel out anyway. And the only thing you have to deal with is the difference or this air and this water, the purple water. However, let's write Bernoulli's equations here. Now, this is that legal kind of thing. We'll start with P naught prime plus gamma Z naught prime rho V naught prime squared. And it has to be written to P2 plus gamma Z2 plus rho V2 squared over 2. Now P naught plus gamma Z naught plus rho V naught squared over 2 is equal to P1 plus gamma Z1 plus rho V1 squared. Now again, legally you can write here and legally you can write there. However, you're not supposed to be able to write directly between 1 and 2 except the fact that since these are a micron or two apart their energy is almost equal so this means you can write between one and two by going through this way up through here and back through here if that's the case then we're just most mostly interested in the pressure at this point and the pressure at that point Okay, so let's take off and take a look at that. P1 plus gamma Z1 plus rho V1 squared over 2 is equal to P2 plus gamma Z2 plus rho V2 squared over 2. Now, I have drawn that there is an elevation difference between these, but these pitot tubes are very, very small, and gamma of air is very small. So therefore, these two terms almost equal each other. So I can make the argument that they equal and go on. I also recognize that this term is a stagnation term. Meaning that I end up with P1 is it well I can go ahead and move this across. P1 minus P2 is equal to rho v2 squared over 2. Well, the velocity 2 out here isn't that much difference, if any, than the velocity out here. It's just slipping over the top of the surface. 
and actually it generally won't be. The only problem you might be is if these two these drill holes are too close to up here where there's a curvature. Now, now we're basically relying on the manometer equation again. So if you wanted to be particular, you could start with P2, for example. Here, I'm going to go ahead and call this K. P2. Now, I'm going to be going down and through this thing. So I'm going to be starting and going down and through a manometer. So since actually this is air and this is air, my interfaces here are right here and right there. So I can start at P2. I go down plus I'm going through the yellow. K times gamma of air. So if I did that, I started at 2, I made my way down through here to this location. Then I have to go down another H through gamma of water. I'm running out of space, so... Don't know why it moved both of them. Okay, so where was I? I made my way to this interface. That was to the first interface. I made my way to the second interface. Okay, so I went down to this point. Now I got to come back up. I'm coming up through H, a value of H, through gamma of air. Then I've got to come back up K through gamma of air. And that gives me P1, I believe. And it takes me all the way back to 1. Now, of course. Regardless, this term cancels that term, and I end up with P1 minus P2 is equal to H times gamma of water minus H times gamma of air. So I can just put this together, or I can just say that this term is very small compared to this term, and I can end up with H times gamma of air now, I'm sorry, of water, I better carry all this, H times gamma of air equals to rho velocity 2 squared over 2. Now, here's a sticking point. Is this air or water? The fact of the matter is, Bernoulli's equation all of Bernoulli's equation, every bit of this here and every bit of this here is all through air. There is no water here. The water only exists in this purple. So only the water shows up in this one location here. So this means everything else is air. So now I have a solution to this. V2 is equal to the square root of moving the 2 over. I'd have H gamma of water minus H gamma of air. Oh, now I better put a 2 there. And I divide rho of air. And essentially that gives me that. Now usually people go in and they assume this term is small compared to the other term and work with the other two terms but whether it is or isn't doesn't matter so this is what's commonly used in an aircraft although they don't attach a manometer to the bottom they attach a pressure gauge a differential pressure gauge 
So in the cabin somewhere you're reading a dial which is associated with a pressure difference and the dial is reading P1 minus P2. It's essentially reading this and it scales it so that you get the velocity out of it. Okay, so that's another 40 minutes of lecture time. That's enough for this week and we'll go on to next week.